Good morning. This is going to be a little bit different this morning. Justin is out of town and not able to do the, uh, the normal um, online service, so we won't be having the music, and I'll be reading the scripture for you this morning, so it'll just kind of be just the scripture and, uh, and, the, uh, and the message this morning, but I trust it'll be an encouragement to you just the same. We will take a few moments and go through some announcements. Our memory verse for this week, if you're keeping up with that, is Ephesians 5, 15 to 16. I hope you're memorizing those. Uh, next, This is a short one, uh, and next week's is short as well, even though it's two verses long, uh, and that's Ephesians 6, 10 to 11, having to do with the armor of God. So don't forget to review the verses that you've learned and keep up with this, and you'll have a good stable of verses that you can uh, use in the future and call, recall to memory. This evening at 6 o'clock, we're going to view the first section of the American Family Association video, In His Image. It has to do with how we were created. It has to do with the gender difference in the plan of God. And it has to do with the compassionate response and ministry to those who are trapped in gender confusion. I hope that you'll consider being here for that at 6 o'clock tonight. We've been reading the book, What is the Gospel? by Greg Gilbert. And our uh, Rustic Hills Book Club discussion on that book is scheduled for a week from Thursday, April 29th. The questions are printed and ready for you to look over, and they're in the middle foyer, so I hope that you'll uh, take a look at those and get ready for that. We've been announcing a mentor-mentee training session scheduled for May 1st, but we're postponing that to a later date. We don't know when yet, but we're going to postpone that. I'm going to be having surgery the next day, uh, or actually the day before that, on, on uh, April 30th. And, um, and we haven't had any uh, signups, so there hasn't been a, a great demand for it. So we're going to postpone that till later and uh, work with those who have already been through the training and see what we can do to get some mentoring going on here. The deacons have set May 8th as a work day, and there is a work day schedule of events that we want to accomplish, things we want to accomplish, uh, posted here at the church. We'll be cleaning and sprucing and working in the yard and picking up and generally working to get rid of winter dirt and crud. So I hope that you'll join us and help to make God's house look uh, good for the summer months. We are planning to host Josiah Brown as a summer intern. Josiah is from Faith Baptist Bible College, and we've been saying that he'll be here from May 10th to July 30th. Those dates have changed a little bit. The July 30th is still the same, but he won't be arriving until July or until May 19th. May 19 instead of May 10. So uh, keep that in mind. Pastor uh, Bailey and myself have been working to prepare for our guest, and we're praying that this young man will be a blessing to us and that we can be a blessing to him as well. So I hope that that will be the case. Our scripture meet reading is from Mark chapter 3, and it's verses 13 through 19. And it has to do with the calling of the 12 apostles. Mark chapter 3 starting with verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went into a house. And we know the Lord adds his blessing when we read his word. Let's bow for prayer. Father, the world often treats Jesus with disrespect, even contempt. They use his name as a curse word. Some refuse to believe that he even lived. Skeptics say that his death was meaningless and there was no resurrection. They do not believe that salvation is found in Jesus. But this isn't new. This kind of skepticism has been around for a long time and it hasn't been confined to atheists. The religious leaders of Jesus' day refuse to acknowledge him as Lord. But we do. We honor him this morning as Savior, as Lord, as Master, and as King of our lives. We magnify his name above every name, and we bow the knee in worship. 
Father, we also want to bring our teammates in ministry to you in prayer this morning, thinking of Steve and Joanne Carter. While they are retired officially, they continue to serve you in any way that they can. And I pray that you'll minister to Steve and to Joanne, minister to their physical needs. Steve has had some physical challenges of late. I would ask that you would guide them in their work for you, even in these sunset years of their lives. We pray for our brothers and sisters at Airport Boulevard Baptist up in Aurora, for Pastor Sanders and for his wife Cheryl, and would ask that you would bless their service and bless their ministry today. We pray again for our brothers and sisters at Faith Baptist Fowler in Fowler, and would ask that you would bless them as they seek a new pastor, and we would ask that you would bless uh, Pastor uh, Anderson and his wife Joy and their family as they Uh, get ready to transition to Cleveland and into the new responsibilities that he has. We have heard recently, Father, that Pastor Farlow from South Holly Baptist Church is going to be leaving the state and leaving the church. And I pray that you'll minister to that church as well and that you'll direct them and guide them. We pray for Zach and Shauna Graham. Actually, Zach and Shauna Killiman. Shauna used to be a Graham. They're serving you up in Greeley. Uh, but also, Father, thinking about the possibility of missionary work in Bangladesh, and I pray that you'll minister to them as they consider your will and try to follow what you have for them. And then, Father, thinking of those who are in positions of civic responsibility, we think of our Supreme Court justices, both at the U.S. level and at the state level here in Colorado. They are often tasked with making difficult decisions on very important matters, and I pray that you'll give them wisdom in these decisions. Pray for our mayor here at the local level, Mayor Southers, and for our city and county first responders and the responsibility these folks have to protect us and to uphold the law in our area. We pray for our city council persons, Yolanda Avia and Dave Donaldson. I would ask God that you would guide these people as they serve you, uh, serve us and serve you in that capacity. We pray for our county commissioner, Holly Williams, and uh, we pray that you would minister through her and the rest of the county commission as they serve us here in El Paso County. And now, Father, help us to see that Jesus did indeed claim to be equal with the Father and that he came to save us from our sins. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message this morning is entitled, Equal with God. And it's from John chapter 5, verses 16 to 23. We're going to see that Jesus claimed rightly to be one with the Father. So we're back in our John series this morning, here in John 5. The last time we were in this chapter, back in mid-March, we focused on a healing at the Bethesda pool, and that was in verses 1 through 15. The rest of the chapter, starting with verse 16, where we'll be starting this morning, amounts to Jesus' response to Jewish leaders and their confrontation and their hatred. So let's, let's uh, set some context here for this morning's message. In those first 15 verses, a man was healed at the pool of Bethesda. And he was healed on the Sabbath day. So as he was walking home from that pool, carrying his bed, the Jewish leaders stopped the man. And they questioned him about the healing. They told him that he was breaking Sabbath law by carrying his bed on the, on the Sabbath and wanted to know who had healed him. And who had told him to carry his bed? Well, at first the man didn't know who it was because the place was crowded and Jesus had disappeared into the crowd and didn't identify himself or the man hadn't asked. He didn't know who it was. And then a little while later, Jesus revealed himself to the man in the temple. When that happened, then the man went to the Sanhedrin, to the Jewish leaders, and reported that it had been Jesus. So, what we have in the first 15 verses is a notable miracle combined with a controversy over the timing of that miracle. Should he have healed somebody on the Sabbath day? Already, Jesus is on the radar of the Jewish leadership. They don't like him. And they're looking for ways to silence him, or at least to diminish his influence, but they really want to silence him. Here in this passage, starting in verse 16, Jesus is about to enter into a conversation with these Jewish leaders, a conversation about who he is, his person, and what is his relationship with God the Father. Is he God? That is, is Jesus God? Is he unified in purpose and in action? And in fact, 
in substance with the Father? Is he one with the Father? The Jewish leaders don't believe any of that. But they want to catch him in his words and disgrace him. And so this conversation begins here in verse 16. Now, this is not just a 2,000-year-old conversation between people who don't like each other. There are all kinds of those that we've never heard of. This is important to us today because there are some today who say that Jesus is not God and never claimed to be. There are some today who say that Jesus is a God, but not the God, and not equal with Father God. But what does Jesus say? Well, if you haven't already done so, open your Bibles to John chapter 5, and let's take a look. I want you to see in verses 16 through 18 that there was human opposition to Jesus. The beginning of verse 16 tells us that the Jewish leaders were out to get him. For this reason, it says, at the beginning of verse 16, the Jews persecuted Jesus. For what reason? We'll skip to the end of the verse. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath day and told him, go ahead, pick up your bed and go home. And that angered the Jewish leaders. You weren't supposed to do that in their view. But they weren't just interested in shutting him up. Look at what else it says in the verse. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. And that thought is repeated in verse 18. Now that seems extreme to us, but to the Jews, Jesus was violating a cardinal tenet of Jewish faith. He was also threatening their power and influence. He was a growing menace as far as they were concerned, and they sensed they needed to eliminate him, so they wanted to get rid of him permanently. Now Jesus responded to them in verse 17, and he says this, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Sounds innocuous, not particularly threatening, at least not to us. But here's what the Jews heard. God the Father has been at work. God the Father is my Father. I have been at work doing the same things. God the Father and I are one. That's what the Jews heard. Therefore, it says in verse 18, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath from their legalistic perspective, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And there's the title of our message this morning and the issue that we want to deal with. Liberal Christians may not recognize that Jesus claimed deity. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons may not recognize that Jesus was deity. Atheists may not even think there is a deity. But these Jewish rulers knew exactly what Jesus was saying, and they wanted to kill him for it. God the Father, Jesus said, is my Father, in a way that no one else can claim. But Jesus was not willing, nor was he afraid to back down. In fact, he made five claims, starting in verse 19, that reinforced his claim to unity with the Father. So let's take a look at those five claims. First of all, there was a unified Father-Son ministry. Here's what it says in verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Jesus said, I and my Father are unified in ministry. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. Now, was Jesus saying that he was incapable of doing anything apart from the Father? In a sense, yes. But not from an ability perspective. He was able, as God Almighty, to do whatever he wanted. But he did not have the authority to act outside the Father's will. In addition, he was limited by his own desire to do the Father's will. Jesus had no interest in acting against the Father or apart from what the Father wanted done. He was all in on what the Father wanted to accomplish. So he went on. For whatever he does, that is, whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like manner. The work that Jesus did on earth 
was a mirror image of what the Father was working on. You may have heard the expression on the other side of this coin. You may have heard the expression, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Well, that was not true in any sense or at any time between Jesus and God the Father. The Father and Jesus always not only knew what the other was doing, but acted in complete concert. They were in perfect sync. Now, Jesus is also making the not-so-subtle claim that he is on earth doing divine work. You can almost hear the Pharisee teeth grinding. Whatever the Father does, the, the Son does, notice this phrase, in like manner. Just as God the Father works, so does Jesus work, in the same way as God. So Jesus rightly claimed oneness with the Father in ministry. It goes on, look at the first part of verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. There was a unified personal relationship between Father and Son. There was no competition between Jesus and his father, no animosity. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he was perfectly in line with what the father wanted him to do, and he knew it. He and his father shared, in fact, they continued to share, a relationship that bound them together in love. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment, you remember what he cited. He cited Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. You can find this in Matthew 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In Matthew, he uses the word mind, with all your mind. Well, when Jesus quoted that, he was living that. He and the Father had a love relationship, still do have a love relationship. He knew his Father loved him, and he returned that love unconditionally. What a difference between himself and the legalistic, heartless Jewish leaders around him. They did what they did in order to check the boxes. They did what they did in order to enrich themselves. They did what they did in order to uh, extend their political power. Affection for God was not their primary thought. It may not have occurred to them at all. Their religion was based upon human works and personal gain. But in verse 20, Jesus rightly claimed oneness with the Father in a loving relationship. At the end of verse 20 and on to verse 21, it tells us that there was a unified father-son creativity. Here's what it says. And he will show himself greater, show him, I'm sorry, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. raises the dead, and gives life. In your notes, this point has to do with creativity, because only God can create life. Only God can give life. Only God can take dead matter and breathe life into it. You remember the creation story in Genesis chapter 2. When Adam was created, his whole body was formed, but it was not yet alive. It was all there. All the components were in place, but the breath of life was not in him yet. Once God breathed life into Adam, then he became a living being. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. So life did not come from Adam. Life did not come from the elements in the ground out of which God made Adam. Life came from God. And God is the only one who can provide life. God Father and Son brought Adam and Eve to life in Genesis 2. God the Son brought life to the son of the widow of Nain in Luke chapter 7. God the Son raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. And God, both Father and Son, raised Jesus from the dead in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 8. Life comes from God and God alone. Only He can create. So at the end of verse 20 and on to verse 21, Jesus rightly claimed oneness with the Father in his ability to create life. In verse 22, you have delegation. God the Father has every right to judge right from wrong, to judge those who have the uh, the right to a relationship with God and those who don't. In fact, only God can judge 
accurately. Perfect judgment requires perfect knowledge, perfect understanding, perfect wisdom. It can't be imperfect in any way or in, in the slightest. No one possesses that kind of perfection apart from God. But Jesus said the Father judges no one. He doesn't judge at all. He's delegated judgment. He's committed all judgment responsibility to someone else. And the verse tells us who. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That someone is Jesus. He's the judge. And he has to be divine to make those kinds of judgment calls perfectly. Because God the Father would not allow anyone to make those judgment calls imperfectly. Now that tells me that Jesus is God. That Jesus is the righteous judge. That Jesus is, as Abraham called him, the judge of all the earth. Genesis chapter 18. It also tells me that the Father has absolute confidence that Jesus will make the right call every time. Whatever the Father would do by way of judgment and justice, Jesus will do. So in verse 22, Jesus rightly claimed oneness with the Father in judgment. You starting to see a pattern here? And, and can you just see the Pharisees getting more and more upset the more Jesus talks? I am one with the Father in ministry. I am one with the Father in relationship. I am one with the Father in creativity. I am one with the Father in judgment. And I have one more. And this is really going to drive you nuts if you don't believe. The Father and Son deserve the same respect. Jesus wasn't getting respect from the Jewish leaders. They not only didn't believe him, they wanted to kill him. But Jesus said all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. If you honor the Father with worship, you need to honor the Son with worship. Oh, I'm sure they were upset by that. If you honor the Father with respect, you need to honor the Son with respect. If you honor the Father with love, you need to honor the Son with love. If you honor the Father as God, you need to honor the Son as God. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Both are worthy of the same respect because both have the same Character, the same attributes, the same person. Both are God. In verse 23, Jesus rightly claimed oneness with the Father in terms of respect. Now, if there's any doubt in the minds of the Pharisees, and verse 18 tells us there really wasn't, but if there was any doubt in the minds of the Pharisees as to what Jesus was claiming, he erased it with that series of statements in verses 19 through 23. God is my Father. God is, uh, God and I are one. We are on the same page. In fact, we are the same. The religious leaders were looking for something different in a Messiah. They had a preconceived notion as to what a Messiah would look like. And it wasn't a carpenter from Nazareth. They closed their eyes tight to all the evidence and they, they objected vehemently to Jesus. He was not the one that they wanted to follow. He was a threat to their religious influence and to their political power. So on the grounds that he didn't observe the Sabbath in the way that they thought he ought to observe it, and that he claimed equality with God when they didn't think that was the case, they rejected him and plotted to kill him. They ignored the evidence right in front of their eyes and got hung up on their own twisted version of Sabbath keeping. And once they were hung up on that, the idea that Jesus and the Father were the same, that just grated against everything that they believed. But Jesus didn't shy away from who he was just to calm their religious jitters. He showed himself to be Lord of the Sabbath. And he showed himself to be equal with God. And if there's any doubt as to whether he was making that claim, you hear people say, Jesus never claimed to be divine. Huh. If there's any doubt as to whether he was making that claim, just look at the reaction from the Jews. They sought to kill him. Why? Because he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. 
So what's your response? What will you do with Jesus? And that's a question we should be asking ourselves all the time. As, as unbelievers, we should be asking ourselves that question and saying, I got to do something with this guy. He, he's, he's made the claim to be God, and he says, I need to trust him to be in order to be my Savior. I, I need to do something. I need to respond in one way or another. What will you do with Jesus? Will you recognize him as Savior? If you're a Christian, will you recognize him as Lord? That is, will you allow him to function as king of your life? Will you honor him as God? Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for this passage, and thank you for the opportunity to look into it for a few minutes this morning. I pray that you'll use this time in your word to encourage us and to walk with us through the whole concept of the Trinity and the equality of Jesus with his Father, and help us understand that uh, not only do others make that claim for Jesus, but Jesus made that claim for himself. He did claim to be equal with God. And the people who were his worst enemies on earth at the time understood fully what he was saying. Father, I pray that, first of all, that you'll help us to reject the skeptics of our age who continue to make the, the same kinds of claims that the Pharisees made. This isn't new. Continue to reject Christ. And help us, Father, also to honor him, to put him on the pedestal he belongs on, to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, as God Almighty and to worship him in that regard. Thank you for our time together in your word. Encourage us and instruct us from this, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This brings our service to a close, and we're going to uh, be done here with the online service in just a moment. I want to encourage you once again, uh, if you are in, uh, interested in giving, to either do that through Tithely on our website, which is www.rustichillsbaptist.org, or uh, you can send a check into the church at 1927 North Murray, uh, Colorado Springs, 80915, and we would be happy to take care of that for you. We're not begging you to give so that we can somehow enrich ourselves. We are begging you to give in order to honor the Lord Jesus. It's for you that you should give, not for us. So if you're thinking of that in that direction, those are the two ways that you can do that. Uh, you can also drop it off if you'd like at the church. We would be happy to see you if you would choose to do that. The Lord bless you. Have a great afternoon.